long as I'm president of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. And I am Naz Modirzadeh, and welcome to the second episode of Hold Your Fire. This week, we're going to be talking about Afghanistan and the upcoming peace talks with Andrew Watkins. But before we get there, Rob, I thought maybe we could take a few minutes to discuss some of the events of this week. I was watching and uh, reading about President Macron's visit to Beirut, and I found his comments to the Lebanese authorities pretty surprising. A former mandate power and a regional colonial actor using a tone that I think for many is quite evocative of those colonial days saying this is your last chance you need to produce a government otherwise it's the end of the line what's your take on his approach and why we haven't seen perhaps more of a backlash from the Lebanese public uh, regarding the comments from President Macron now it, it struck me too if you had told me a few years ago that a country like France would go to a country like Lebanon or the president of France and sound as if he was dictating to them what they mm. needed to do or else. I would have expected the kind of backlash from nationalists, but basically across the spectrum. The fact that that didn't happen, I think, tells us so much, not about France or its image, but about the Lebanese leading ruling class and its image uh, in the eyes of the Lebanese. And I think at this point, given how discredited the Lebanese elite is, the only thing the Lebanese that is sort of holding them together is their survival instinct. They're fully divided, they're polarized, but they come together on one issue, which is their survival, which means not touching the system. And I think there's been so much disgust, so much impatience. And as you know, what's happened in Lebanon over the last months and weeks has been so catastrophic for the country that I think they just at this point are prepared to accept from a French leader something they would not have accepted in the past. And the reaction has been extremely muted from across the political spectrum, including from Hezbollah, sort of the most militant of the Lebanese organizations. Yeah, and it seems like it's also saying, you know, the protest movement has not managed to produce a viable option or a viable leader. Do you think this is going to spur, do you have any hope that this is going to mobilize some kind of a solution that the Lebanese government itself has not yet been able to produce? I don't think anyone has lost any money betting on the Lebanese not moving forward. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound optimistic on this. I do think that there's more pressure. There's pressure from the street. There's now pressure from France. And again, the fact that the Lebanese ruling class didn't push back against the French tells you something about their awareness of how they are discredited in the eyes of the public. But my assumption is that they are playing a long game. They're hoping that over the next weeks and months, people will forget and they'll go back to their old ways. Because new ways they fear are threatening their positions of power, their uh, control of the, the resource flow. So it's a gamble that Macron is taking, as with much of what he does. It's a gamble that has a lot to be admired, but also a lot to be somewhat fearful of, because it may well collapse, it may well fail, and then people are going to turn around and say, well, yes, France was trying to dictate to another country what it should do. And that usually doesn't really work all that well. This question of the French coming to Lebanon and sort of telling them, trying to hold them accountable, it, it brought to mind another event that has occurred over the last week, which is the U.S. decision to sanction an institution and its leadership that whose job is to hold countries accountable. And I'm talking about the International Criminal Court. And it was striking to me the reverse position. In one case, it's the French, a Western power, telling a developing country, a country of the global south, what it should do and shouldn't do. And then the flip side, you see a country that is accustomed to giving lessons and to trying to sanction everyone to get them in line, refusing to be held accountable by an international institution, the International Criminal Court, and doing something quite remarkable. That maybe you could tell me, since this is really your field, what did you make of the American decision to sanction the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court because it was investigating U.S. actions in Afghanistan? Why, from an administration whose actions have been quite egregious across the board, why this one seems to have tapped a special nerve 
among Europeans in particular. What, what did you make of it? Perhaps in a year of uh, shocking developments and indeed actions and rhetoric from the Trump administration, this has struck a chord and perhaps reaches a new level of, I don't really know what the word is, absurdity, derision by other actors, a display of total disregard for international law and international institutions. I think these opinions are all out there. But essentially, the Trump administration has made the move of uh, continuing with a U.S. rhetoric, I should say, that pre-exists this administration, which is one that says from various spaces within the U.S. government, the U.S. refuses to accept the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. We, of course, already had a law on the books that would have allowed the United States government to take steps should the International Criminal Court have taken U.S. members of the armed forces into custody. These were all pre-Trump. But the move to sanction and list Prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda and uh, one of her deputies, I think has struck many as a bridge too far. So we've seen a real statement from many, many European governments saying this is unacceptable. A number of governments have even called it a kind of attack or a threat against the International Criminal Court and a sense that this has to be rejected by the many European states that have supported the court and its development over the years. I think there is a sense in a way that it's a move beyond some of the U.S.'s more symbolic rejections of the court, while it was quietly often collaborating with the court and helping the court to develop and take on cases pre-Trump administration to an open declaration that the U.S. government will do whatever it takes to avoid coming within the crosshairs of the court and its judges. So I think definitely shocking to many. We've seen a reaction from the European governments that we didn't see to many other moves by the Trump administration this year. And I think, like you said, it does raise a fundamental question about U.S. sanctions. For many years, the U.S. has claimed that its bilateral sanctions are an effort to extend or to bolster a multilateral agreement that sanctions are required. But the U.S. is the one that's, you know, willing to move forward and impose those sanctions, perhaps without the blockages faced in intergovernmental organizations. Now, I think there is an open statement on the part of the U.S. government that if you anger this administration, they can use a mechanism that was fundamentally created to list and block assets of terrorists, drug cartel leaders, and others against anybody that angers the administration, anybody the administration doesn't like. I think it raises a real question about the overall legitimacy of U.S. bilateral sanctions at this point. Now, I suspect it also raises further questions about the legitimacy of the International Criminal Court, which many have already viewed as being slanted and going after African leaders, but not after others, and particularly not after Western leaders. This is only going to confirm that of course, it raises a broader question, which will, is a good segue to our next conversation, which is what responsibility, what accountability should there be for a country like the U.S. that has intervened in a country like Afghanistan? And it's uh, no coincidence that we want to talk about Afghanistan today because the case that the ICC was bringing or was investigating against the U.S. had to do with U.S. actions in Afghanistan. And so I'm delighted to have Andrew Watkins with us today. Hold your fire a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Rob. Hi, Naz. Thanks for having me. It's really great to have you. Your recent arrival at Crisis Group, but so happy to have you at this time. You came only a few weeks, actually, before the negotiations between the U.S. and the and the Taliban bore fruit. So you came at a very active period. And, you know, for us, Afghanistan is really a microcosm of all of the questions that we are thinking about when we think about peace and conflict, the cost of intervention. And we'll be talking about that, the cost of U.S. intervention, the longest war in U.S. history. The responsibility, as I just said, that a country like the U.S. has when it invades, for whatever reason, one could say it was a justified war or not, but does it have a responsibility now to get it right, only to leave when things are right, or should it leave because it's doing more harm than good? And then the third issue that we struggle with in all these cases of peace and, and conflict is that reaching the right balance between peace on the one hand, 
but and stability, but also democracy, human rights, the rights of women. And in this case, it may be that peace and the end of conflict requires the U.S. to get out and to let the Afghans deal with their own problems. But on the other hand, there's the risk that a withdrawal by the U.S. would leave Afghanistan in the throes of a different kind of problem, a different kind of nightmare, perhaps, which is human rights violations, the end of democracy and the end of equal rights for women. So we're going to try to talk about all that in the time that we have. I do want to start with one very uh, simple question for you, Andrew, which is, where are we today? I mean, you know, we've been talking about the inter-Afghan negotiations now for some time. I'd call them the off-again, off-again talks. Where are we? What's standing in the way? What do you think we're going to see uh, happen in the coming weeks? Today, we are at what feels like the end of a fragile, tense transition period in between the historic agreement that was signed between the U.S. and the Taliban on 29 February and what was supposed to be, what the United States at least intended and hoped would be, a very quick segue into intra-Afghan talks between the Taliban and representatives of the Afghan government and other Afghan political figures. What wound up happening is now six months later, those talks have yet to even commence. And in the last several days, in the last week, diplomats, international figures, states, and organizations that have been supporting this process have begun to gather in Doha. And there is some real momentum and belief that finally the many hurdles that cropped up since 29 February to getting these talks started might finally be clearing away. But we still have what seems like a few days or or maybe even a few weeks left to go before these things get started. Obviously, this is back and forth between the Taliban and the Afghan government. What it seems to suggest, to me at least, but tell me if I'm wrong, is that the Afghan government as you said, has been skeptical about this deal between the U.S. and Taliban, not negotiated behind their back, but without the Afghan government's participation. And the Afghan government, its survival depends on the continued presence of U.S. military forces in Afghanistan. If they leave, I think the writing is on the wall that this government will disappear. Who knows? Well, I'll ask you later whether you think the Taliban will automatically prevail. But it does raise the question, as I said, of the responsibility that the U.S. has or doesn't. And from your perspective, you've been in going back and forth to Afghanistan and living there for the past decade or so. When you speak to Afghans, and I'm sure the view is very different depending on who you talk to, what is their assessment of the U.S. presence? It's been now you know, 20 years or so, almost 20 years. Do they look at it and say, what was this all about if we're now the U.S. is going to leave and the Taliban are in a position of power. What did it amount to? And what, you know, again, what responsibility do you feel the U.S. might have towards Afghans? You started with a small question. Uh, The perspective of Afghans on the American presence in their country the last two decades and what it has meant and an Afghan perspective on America's responsibility, it differs greatly based on the positionality of the Afghans that you're speaking to. There are many in Kabul, whether they are affiliated with the Afghan government or not, whether they are more progressive or modern or secular or perhaps none of those things, if they have benefited from the U.S. presence in many of the ways that civil society and the media and business have thrived, though there are many problems, you know, many sectors in Afghanistan have thrived, then the perspective is that the Americans owe quite a bit and that their moral responsibility is quite large. That perspective changes quite a bit depending on where in the country you move. And obviously in Afghanistan, even those who are immersed in field work have difficulty reaching out to areas, the areas where we might find the most interesting responses about U.S. presence. People whose populations and communities have suffered the most from, say, American aerial bombardment or night raids into their homes and against their families. We hear much less of this, not just in international press, but even those of us trying to conduct field work. Something that captured the difficulty of understanding the American perspective and what its presence meant was an interview former President Karzai gave as he was exiting the office in 2014. He was asked, what were the American objectives? Why were they here and why are they still here? And he said, honestly, I don't know. 
I really have never been able to tell. And if the head of state had such difficulty grappling with that, I think there's a continuity in that that stretches into today. Many Afghans are, are simply more confused than they were even five years ago. So if I want to sum up what you said is that all Afghans would agree that the U.S. has a responsibility. Some believe they have a responsibility to stay and others believe they have a responsibility to leave. That's very concisely and, and well put. Andrew, can I ask in one note on this responsibility issue, just tying it back to our conversation about the ICC, I think one of the perhaps disappointing things about the rules that apply here, of course, is that while I think all of us can agree that there is a moral responsibility after 20 years plus of intervention in the country in various ways, I think the U.S. has been very, very careful about the way it has approached its formal legal obligations to ensure that it has no formal responsibility. It could walk away and wash its hands of Afghanistan tomorrow. And I wanted to ask you, what's your sense of the leverage that the U.S. has at this point? So you have a president who's making it very clear, I want to be out of this country as soon as possible. Is that affecting your sense on the ground of where the U.S.'s power to move things at all, whether it's popular or not? That's a great question, Naz. I want to take half a step back just to say you're absolutely right and on target, not only in the sense that the United States has postured itself to avoid legal responsibility, but even in the text of the agreement with the Taliban. That text is laden with ambiguity that actually doesn't make it very clear what conditions would either prompt the United States to follow through and perform a full military withdrawal, or if it chooses to, to remain behind. And so even as it negotiates an exit, that lack of clarity on responsibility remains. In terms of the leverage, this is really interesting because as much as it may feel like either with the actual tangible drawdown in troop numbers and the physical presence, or maybe more in terms of perception with the building sense that U.S. political momentum is heading towards withdrawal and disengagement. Nonetheless, the United States remains more able than any other actor in the international community to affect change and to leverage its position against both sides of this conflict, both the Taliban and the Afghan government. Only the United States can deliver what the Taliban consider to be its ultimate goal and objective, which is the removal of all foreign troops and, and most foreign influence from the country. Conversely, the Afghan government, as Rob noted, is existentially dependent on U.S. financial and military aid. And so what it wants is for that aid to continue. And so in that sense, perhaps... In relative terms, compared to other years and other periods, the United States may have less leverage than it had several years ago or a decade ago. But in absolute terms, compared to any other actor, it's still able to wield far more influence and can be the decisive actor in a process like this. Andrew, one more follow-up on that is your sense vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban is the main good that the U.S. can deliver leaving? I mean, is that their leverage with the Taliban? That's certainly what the Taliban want. And the Taliban have, for all of their own ambiguities and inconsistencies, their one consistent ideological point has been the withdrawal of foreign occupiers, as they put it. And so the U.S. being able to deliver that and being able to deliver that in a way that all other NATO partners in the Resolute Support military mission there are obliged to follow, follow suit. Yeah, the United States is able to deliver uh, what the Taliban want most. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Today, we are talking with Andrew Watkins. So you mentioned the Taliban. And this one of the things that I enjoy most and I find most interesting about Crisis Group and valuable is that we speak to all sides of the conflict, no matter who they are. And so we have had, and you have had, extensive engagement, and your, your colleagues have had extensive engagement with the Taliban. We wrote a report recently that tried to look at what the Taliban want from these talks to the extent that one could decipher it. So let me sort of piggybacking on what Naz asked. Yes, there's some U.S. leverage, but 
you know, once you know that the U.S. is going to leave and the writing is more or less on the wall, at some point, sooner or later, the U.S. will leave, the Taliban could just play a waiting game. And what I hear from some Afghans, clearly from one side of the conflict, is at that point, we are left to our own devices. And we saw what the Taliban did, you know, back in the 90s. Nothing indicates, as they put it, that they have changed ideologically. And there'll be no leverage because at that point, the U.S. will be gone or on its way out. So, what as a somebody who's trying to resolve the conflict, what do you say to those who argue, you know, the U.S. leaving really is making us vulnerable to and in the hands of the good or bad will of an organization whose record is pretty dark? My response would be that many Afghans are already incredibly vulnerable to this organization, even with the United States and its military presence and all of its financial support, as it has been throughout most of the last two decades, neither the Afghan state nor the international partners that support it have been able to protect much of Afghanistan's countryside from the Taliban's expanding reach and influence. You hear many Afghans say, yes, but the Taliban are only in the rural countryside and the majority of the Afghan population remains safely in government control. We have all of the big cities But we have to remember that nearly 70% of Afghanistan's population is still rural. And there are many districts across the country where government control is an illusion of several villages that government troops are forced to helicopter in and out of and are unable to access any of the actual district. In terms of vulnerability, so much of the population has been vulnerable to the impact of conflict. For the last five years, more than 10,000 civilians have been killed or injured each year. The vulnerability is already there. I would turn the concern on its head if the United States already intends to leave anything it can obtain from the Taliban through diplomatic means and through negotiations is an addition. It's a plus to a decision that the United States seems as many worry to have already made in the first place. But just to press you on this, because it is something we hear, including from people on our board and others who would say, that's fine. But in terms of the living condition of ordinary Afghans, what will stop the Taliban as time goes by? You know, they, they may agree to something with the U.S., but what will prevent them, A, from taking over full power and B, from ruling the way they did before? Did you hear anything in your conversations with them that leads you to think, well, maybe this time will be different. Maybe they'll be slightly more inclusive. Maybe they won't rule with as much of an iron fist as they did and in such a backward way as they did in the 90s. What's your sense of all of that? It's fair. It's fair pushback. And it's important to address the concern that the Taliban could either be biding their time or could simply decide when dynamics on the ground change to change their minds suggests In order to understand what that means, we have to look at the dynamic of the military situation. And the situation is, while the Taliban have been able to steadily expand territorially and as an organization and even as a shadow government in some ways, it's not guaranteed that the Taliban could retake and certainly could not easily retake major population centers. Many people have very in a generalized fashion, compared the current moment to the situation of the 1990s, in which the Taliban swept through a civil war ravaged Afghanistan and were able to very easily step into a power vacuum that had been years, or you could argue, more than a decade in the making. If the United States leaves, and even if the United States completely withdraws its financial support and all of the support it offers to the Afghan military, We're talking about years and years of stiff resistance from a highly modernized and professional Afghan security forces. What we heard from the Taliban in our uh, conversations, in our many interviews with them, were two things. Number one, they understand the cost of this war, not only for their followers, but for the communities that they draw their fighters from. And they have been losing thousands of people every year as well in addition to the civilians, in addition to the Afghan army and police. While that's something that they've been able to deal with, that's not something that they want to sustain. And so we do hear a genuine interest 
if they are able to secure their objectives at the negotiation table or enough of their objectives that satisfy them, they would much prefer that to losing another 10,000 fighters each year that this war drags on. And so what would those objectives be in a nutshell? I know that you could go on for a long time, but you said if they could secure their core objectives, how would you define them based on, on your interaction with them? This is where it gets really difficult because their core objectives in broad terms are crystal clear and they've remained clear since the American intervention in late 2001. The first and the primary, and I think the binding universal objective, is to get the foreign troops out. The addendum to that objective is they also want to wipe Afghan society and the Afghan state of foreign influence. They would describe as a stain or a blight since that intervention in 2001. Where it gets complicated is, depending on which Taliban figure you speak to, what that means to rid foreign influence. I mean, it's very easy to talk about what it means to get rid of the foreign troops. But when you talk about the foreign influence and what impact that would have on a future Afghanistan, that depends from Talib to Talib. Andrew, can I push you a little bit more on that? It seems like, and I'm sure you have witnessed this more than most of us, the discourses about Afghanistan tend to be sort of very simplistic, right? So this country that no one can tame. And when we talk about the Taliban, I think there is this tendency to talk about it as though the Taliban has been immune to the impact and transformative change of these 20 years, right? So everybody else changed with the 20 years of intervention, but the Taliban stayed the Taliban that we knew back then. In what ways have, if any, do you read their goals or their approach to governance as having also changed over time, right? Over the, the span of one generation, do you read the 2020 Taliban as having some kind of a governance project beyond simply a rhetoric of rejecting the Western influence? Or is it as simplistic, for lack of a better term, as it was 20 years ago? It's a great question. It's a complicated one. First, I want to say that in our report and in most of our reporting on the Taliban, we have tried to avoid the framing of our research around the question of whether or not the Taliban have changed. Exactly because, as you say, no matter how you try to answer that question, that question creates a simplicity of narratives in one direction or the other. And so in looking at the Taliban, we have to be honest, it has both changed in many different ways, and also in some ways it has not changed very much at all. It simply depends on, you know, in what aspect you mean. So when we talk about the Taliban's governance project, that's something that has been a decade in the making, at the very least. In some ways, the Taliban is more sophisticated in its attempts at least to present the appearance and the functioning of a government than they even were as an emirate in the 1990s. The sophistication Again, at least of the Taliban's presentation of a shadow government, presenting the appearance of a shadow government, really has grown and expanded along with their military stance and, and their territorial expansion. They have created a number of commissions. They have begun to address propaganda to issues of concern among civilians in their community. And fundamentally, they could not exist as they do as a nationwide insurgency spread across very different geography and, and demographics without the support of many people also scattered across Afghanistan. We can't say how many they are or, or exactly who they are, but it's a reality that the Taliban do draw from community support and they have learned, especially over the last decade, how to tend to that. Very briefly, I could go on uh, about their attempts to develop governance. What they fall back on are two understandings. One is an Islamic system of governance, but the other is Afghan traditions of governance. What that gives the Taliban is an institutional flexibility when a local commander, for instance, wants to do things one way instead of the other. If it doesn't quite fit the understanding of what is properly Islamic, 
then it can be justified as an Afghan tradition. Well, the commander is following local customs and norms. And vice versa, if something doesn't follow the local customs and norms or even what the local community wishes for, then the Taliban can have their affiliated clerics issue a fatwa and say that it is properly Islamic. And this is something that they have been able to oscillate between, and it's something that remains an open question at the negotiating table. Many of our assumptions about what Taliban red lines may be or what their desired nature of a future state would look like lean on the assumption that the Taliban are more or less Islamic or derive their values from traditional conservative Afghan life. But the difficulty is they're very adept at swinging between one or the other when it suits their pragmatic ends. So, Andrew, I really want to thank you, but I want to ask you one last, not particularly easy question, but... You know, this is the longest war in American history by quite a few years. Last year was the deadliest war, deadliest conflict, based on our research, what we could find. Project yourself a generation or two from now as Afghans looking back at this period. What will they say about what the U.S. did in Afghanistan? What will their take be, you think, looking back? I think a lot of that will depend on the outcome of these talks, not just in the next weeks, but where they may ultimately lead, there's a lot of cause for skepticism. And there's a lot of reason for Afghans, as well as friends and supporters of Afghanistan, to look at the United States track record. When it militarily disengages from a certain part of the world, there is a pretty solid pattern of also disengaging in terms of financial support and all of the other means of support and boosting. That's bad news for Afghanistan if that pattern holds true and if a U.S. military withdrawal does continue and there's very much uh, cause for concern. Whether the Taliban have the ability to return to ultimate power or to partial power or not, it would certainly bring about continued conflict and continued uh, death and destruction. Maybe a small optimistic note to round off on is you mentioned that as of last year, Afghanistan was the world's deadliest conflict. According to publicly available data this year, unfortunately, while civilian casualties killed and wounded in Afghanistan seem on track to match last year's, in 2020, one thing that we have learned is that Taliban fighters and Afghan security forces are not dying in similar numbers. In fact, American security officials told us that combatant casualties are thousands and thousands lower. And we have to attribute at least some of that to the partial restrictions that both sides have imposed as a result of these fragile attempts to get a peace process started. Thanks very much, Andrew. I guess in 2020, we have to take good news wherever we find it. So we'll end on that note. And uh, I think once again, a conversation we can very much imagine continuing. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Rob, before we close, I wanted to ask you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about ICG's publications this week? Yeah, and first I want to echo what Naz said. Thank you, Andrew. I know how much, how personal this is for you and how you have, you know, what happens in Afghanistan, you live very directly. So, and we're looking forward to all the rest of the work you're going to be doing with us for the months and years to come. So we published three pieces in the last week. One is a piece that looks at Ukraine, a series we're doing on Ukraine. This one is looking at the cost, the economic cost of war and trying to make the case that there are steps that the government in Kiev can take vis-a-vis the separatists or vis-a-vis the separatist regions to begin to restitch uh, the country together by trying to mitigate the enormous economic cost of the war. So that's one. We also came out with a briefing on the situation in Gaza, where at the beginning of the pandemic, we feared that Gaza would be a place where the pandemic would spread. And given how overcrowded and the effect of the Israeli blockade, we really feared a catastrophe. It didn't happen. Unfortunately, in the last week and last weeks, we've seen uh, a number of cases that suggest that community spread has occurred. And so we are writing a piece and we wrote a piece in which we urge uh, Israel to take steps to loosen the blockade at a minimum so that vital aid could come to the Palestinians and so sick Palestinians could leave and get treatment elsewhere. And finally, one of the things that we do every month, which is we come out with a crisis watch where we look at 
the situation, the conflict situation around the globe. It's one of the most prominent products that Crisis Group does and one that is uh, one of the most popular things we do, which is really look at country after country for anyone who wants to see what's happened in the last month. It's a great resource. And you could look back uh, and see what happened this last month in Afghanistan or for the last several months and get a great picture, oftentimes a depressing one, of where the conflict stands in any given country. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in to really uh, encourage listeners to look at that the Ukraine report on the cost of war in Donbass. I think all too often in coverage of conflict and war, we tend not to pay enough attention to the impact on livelihoods and the economy. And it's a really important contribution in a conflict that's uh, often forgotten these days in the maelstrom of news we're all. So with that, that's it for this week. Uh, we thank you for listening to Hold Your Fire. If you have any questions, send them to media at crisisgroup.org and we'll be happy to answer them. And thanks again, Andrew, and thank you to Rob and have a good week, everyone. Thank you. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. This group. This group. This group.